twist it. Push gun. There we go. In my head, dear listener, I'm going back and back and back and back. Yeah, I know. <laughs> well, it's like when we do our uh, dog fights with the 108 or if we're flying out of ducks with, with the bush on, uh, you, you definitely did a dagger dagger <laughs> noises, I, I assure you. Welcome to the Damcasters, brought to you in association with the Pima Air and Space Museum. I'm your host, Matt Bell. Over the last while, there's been an interesting trend in warbirds and the way we interact with them, and that is the rise of flying in the back seat of them. So, famously, we've got plenty, <laughs> many, many, many two-seater Spitfires. We have TF-51s as well, the Mustangs with the little monkey seat in the back. And if you're abroad, you can even fly in the back of the Canadian Warplane Heritage Lancaster B-25 in the States. There's plenty of B-25s that'll take you up as well. Now, it's expensive. We're talking thousands of pounds for about a half hour. So it, it is a niche market. But when you go niche within a very small market itself, you get to something like BE-505, the two-seat Hurricane, which is operated by Hurricane Heritage out of White Waltham and other places around the UK. Now, when we were up at Duxford for the Christmas Hurricane show that they had a little while ago, we interviewed Rebecca Greenwood Harding about it. Matt Willis and I had to point out to a few of the punters that had come through which one the two-seater Hurricane was. Because Hawker Restorations have done an incredible job with the aircraft, making it a very sympathetic conversion. Because there never was a proper two-seater Hurricane. There were some weird ones that went out that literally, like open cockpits, they're not great. Anyways, enough rambling. I get to geek out very hard in this episode. So if you're listening to the podcast, it's going to sound pretty normal. But if you're watching the YouTube version, and I'm recording this on video in my new little office with books and everything. The first interview part with Mike Collett, pilot for Hurricane Heritage, and Abigail Clark, who's the ground operations boss, is a standard chat. But the walk around in the cockpit tour we do of BE-505, where we learn how to turn her on and things like that, that sounds naughty, you know what I mean, that is all recorded as a video. So do check out the YouTube version as well. I hope you enjoy this. This is me putting my face out there on YouTube, which is never great. We'll see how that goes. In the meantime, let's start with Mike and find out how does someone start their journey to flying hurricanes? What was the bug? What got him into it? Well, if I'm, if I'm brutally honest, I don't think I've ever wanted to do anything else. <laughs> um, I can't think of any point in my life where I wasn't surrounded by aeroplanes. My father flew gliders and then later microlights when I was growing up as a kid, but you know, a standard childhood with airfix models and of hurricanes and spitfires and posters on your bedroom walls and it, and it's just always been whatever what I you know what I've wanted to do. I think some of my earliest memories is Harvard's flying over my house when I was a kid. So, and once you got past the airfix, what was what was your first flight in? Was it normal stuff or was it RAF or...? No, well, I, I sort of misspent childhood growing up at uh, Wickham Air Park, um, Booker Gliding Club. And um, I think my first flight was probably in the back of a tow plane with a glider on the back. There's some photos of me kicking around very, very young, sat in the back. I'm not, yeah, I'm not sure they would ever let you do it these days. but um, So I think that was my first flight. And then I, then I progressed into gliders and, and, and flew gliders for a long time. Yeah. Gliding is an interesting thing. I, I was down at, um, oh, it's gone straight out of my head, up on the hill, ex fighter base, um, Sussex Way. Sutton Bank, yeah. up on the hill, or we Parham? Oh, this is terrible. I had this all prepared. Shallock. No. Where are we talking about? We're, we're part of the country. Um, engineering base, they do engines down there these days. We used to put our seven, seven threes in there. Oh, crap. Oh, Lasham, yes, oh, Lashem. there we go. That's I would say Lasham's on top of a hill. Well, right. it's, yeah, it's, but, it's, um, it's hilly for me. Um, yeah, yeah. Where, where, right. where I am, anyway. Lasham, yeah. yeah, Lash. yeah. Da we was down there doing, doing a talk, and the gliding fraternity is a very passionate one, and there are some who think moving on to something with engines is 
slightly sacrilegious. Yeah, I know, but they all, they all like to be towed up by something <laughs> with an engine generally, or a winch launch. So there is an engine involved somewhere along the lines. That's, um... I... <laughs> I, I just have, I'm just having memories of sitting in the bar and being being told about how there's there's flying in and there's pure flying yeah. by a very old gentleman who was waiting for his taxi because he was no longer in a position to a fly or b drive. Yeah, but that was a good day. No, I mean gliding's fantastic. I mean it is pure flying. It is. Um, I did an awful lot of it. Um, ended up being chief flying instructor and all that sort of stuff. Um, so I had a very busy sort of 14 years doing it between school, university, and stuff. But I. I I don't really miss it. <laughs> I think I did everything I really wanted to do in it. And so maybe one day I'll go back when time becomes more available. Well, it is because you are terribly, terribly busy. And we're here at the wonderful White Waltham, a place with an incredible aviation history. And I do need to see the ATA flag before I leave. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Um, that's the main reason for coming, other than hurricanes. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. That... And there's some lovely photos of the ATA girls. Yeah. Um, on the walls here, it's a short sterlings and things like that. Oh, fantastic! Yeah. But let's get back to you and ultimate aerobatics because that's yeah that's something else we need to talk about because I suppose that's the main gig as opposed to flying flying around in hurricanes as well. Well, I mean, for me personally, my, my main gig is actually I fly business jets, um, but thankfully um, I, I don't go to work particularly often. Which is great, which has allowed me to, to build all this other stuff up in the background with quite a lot of help from people like Abigail and the team that are out there flying the airplanes while we're sat in here drinking tea. Um, but yeah, that's kind of, everything has grown out of Ultimate Aerobatics and, and, and that, that started with a pit special. Um, and then we moved on to an extra and then from the extra we moved into the Harvard and then from the Harvard I moved into the Mark 1 Hurricane and then, and then it's kind of grown into Hurricane Heritage. So. Um, so that's that's where it is. It's, it's um, something I'm immensely proud of. How does something like a pits prepare you for a warbird? Really well, actually. Um, the pits is a little high performance aerobatic aeroplane that um, teaches you everything you could possibly need to know about gyroscopic effects. <laughs> um, because every time you move one of the controls, it has another effect. So, and when you open the power it wants to go off to the left. And so you're fighting that with rudder. And that prepares you really, really well to go and fly these, these high performance warbirds, um, like, such as the Hurricane, where you have massive propellers and huge amounts of power. Also, on landing, they are quite tricky to land and they require a lot of rudder input to keep the aircraft straight. Um, all of these are really good skills to then transfer into flying warbirds. Slightly different. But if you can land a pit special, especially at White Waltham, um, then you're in a really good position to go and fly anything else. They're stunning, stomach-turningly amazing to watch do their things, mm. the, those aircraft. And um, I, the podcast is sponsored by Pima Air and Space, and they look after Melanie yeah. Estes as, as well. But <laughs> <laughs> we w we will chat because what those acrobatic aircraft, other than pits as well, especially the modern stuff, can do is it looks physics-defying. Yeah, a lot of the time. Yeah, it's great, and it's um, and again, you can use the gyroscopic effects of the huge engines that we've got in these aerobatic aeroplanes to do stuff that you people just go, "How are you doing that?" <laughs> um, it's, it's, it's quite straightforward, but you know, let's let's not. Oh, let's, so the, let's the not leave, leave some mystique yeah, exactly. in, yeah, please. Yeah, there but you go. Um, yeah, so when I do an aerobatic display in something like the Cap Two Three Two or our Extra. The, the way that I fly that aeroplane is very, very different to the way that I will display the Hurricane on the Harvard. It's just, there's very, two very different um, ways of flying aeroplanes. Because I guess that's the main thing. When we see a Warbird fly, we're seeing it being flown in a very specific set of parameters as yes. opposed to um, an aerobatic aircraft. Because even, even though these restored aircraft, a lot of them are fresh, they are still an old aeroplane. That's so, right. What what goes into before we get on to talking about your first go in a warbird? What is that set of parameters like for displaying it? Because I, I yeah we we've, we've heard some people talk about it, but when you're getting into one and you know you're going to display, there's certain rules. You're not going to want to overstress or go yeah, too right. much power. Um, lots of prep and practice, um, and our practice is. Is something that we don't get huge amounts um, in, in warbird flying. Now, the whole passenger carrying SSAC rules in the UK 
um, has allowed a lot of us to keep much, much more current than they did in the past. Um, and is, I, for me, it's made Warbird displaying much safer because the pilots are much more current than they, they used to be. Um, I was having a chat with someone like uh, Stu Goldspink a little while ago. He's, you know, in a good year, he might have got seven hours in a hurricane and he would be asked to go and display it and have to just turn up and he, <laughs> maybe the, the transit over to kind of get familiar and suddenly he's rocking into an air show with not huge amounts of practice. Whereas now, you know, I'm fly, we're flying the hurricane most of the days of the week in the summer, so we all are nicely current. Um, from a G point of view, the aeroplanes are stressed to quite high G, sort of plus six, but you won't see many people pull more than three G in them. It just doesn't look right. Yeah. It's not what people expect to see from a Spitfire Hurricane. You're looking for smooth, graceful aerobatics and really showing the beauty of the aeroplanes off. Um, from a power point of view, Again, we're, we're barely using half the full power on the aircraft to try and nurse the engine. You know, when you look at the costs of operating these aircraft, the, the, the overhaul costs on the engines are significant. So it's, it's that tricky, tricky aspect of the economy of it, plus ensuring that the punters get good photos. Because you could have a lot of fun yeah. in a display that would look terrible from the outside. Well, that's right. It's so, um, you know, I could go and do an eight-point roll in a hurricane, but people would be going, why is he doing an eight-point roll in a hurricane? Because <laughs> it doesn't look right. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's Abigail, for example, hates it when I do four-point rolls, <laughs> e- even, <laughs> even with a punter that asks for it. She just think it's, it's not a very hurricane manoeuvre. Um, but um, Do you get a stern look when you come back? Uh, when I watch the watch your videos, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, definitely. But... Um, but that for me, you know, do it, doing barrel, big loopy barrel rolls and round, yeah, it's just, that's what these aeroplanes should be flying like. Um, and equally, you're talking about, you know, what people want to see and what they want to take photos of. Most of the time, they just want top side passes and bottom side passes. And, and you can do that with quite a lot of ease. In, in, in. So you can get a nice three quarter shot and put it on the wall. And yeah, this is one. And, and, and at the end of the day, we're, we're trying to entertain the public that are there for a display. We're not trying to scare anyone. You know, and you need to be operating well within the limits of the airplane and well within the limits of the, the pilot. Mm-hmm. So. so would you class, oh, what was your first warbird that you got your hands on on your own? Well, first proper warbird, if we're talking you know, World War II Merlin-powered stuff, um, was the Mark I Hurricane R4118. Um, I was lucky enough to fly some Fokker triplane replicas and obviously got quite a lot of time in Harvard's before. Mm-hmm. Um, that was okay, one. let's pivot. Yeah. Fokker triplane replica. Yeah, we talked about gyroscopic effects and yeah. things. That's all gyroscopic. Well, effects. it is. Um, and, and originally, it would have had a, a full rotary engine, so mm. the whole engine would have rotated mm. rather than just the prop. So the one that I, I was lucky enough to fly um, had a Warner Scarab engine in it, so the engine was stationary but with a two-blade propeller. But um, we were often going off to displays all around the country. Um, flying it and um, it was a very very demanding aeroplane to land <laughs> not so bad taking off not too bad in the air um, but for landing it and it just didn't cope with crosswinds at all it was certainly one of the most interesting things to land the great the great thing is it all happens very slowly so um, <laughs> ground looping is not normally a good thing and it's not a good good thing in a Fokker triplane but I, I will admit that I've, I have ground looped that aeroplane a couple of times where, <laughs> but it's all been very slow and in the end of the day you just see it oh I can't fix it anymore and you just close it, turn the turn the engine off and just see where it stops no damage was ever done I'm, I'm very pleased to say but um, but um, yeah tricky tricky aeroplane I can imagine yeah. especially in confined spaces <laughs> um, which is where you end up because You've, you've either got an option, if, you, if it starts to go, you can try and fix it by giving it a blip, because there was no brakes either, mm. a blip of power, which will re-energise the rudder and might do enough to keep you straight. Um, but if there's, you haven't got a huge amount of room ahead of you, then you're worried that the blip of power will <laughs> take, you, take you into take that, you space, into that space pretty quickly. So you then end up in a position where you go, oh, actually, the best thing to do is actually close the power, try and fix it, but if it's not going to get fixed, shut the engine off and go for a little little journey <laughs> but, um, yeah. which is not something you'd want to do in something like r4118 no no definitely not yes. no, no not all pit special <laughs> or or any other airplanes really um no that would that would definitely be a bad thing to be doing yeah. so we, we when we were outside of chatting did, did you get to fly it with the old chunky 
chunky radios in it or no is that, so you, that, you had the better experience of the two yeah so, yeah so um i think probably pete kinsey um and Stu goldspink probably did the early flying and four on eight after her restoration um, and i think they found out pretty quickly that the the center of gravity was quite a long way aft with the original radio in it plus all the armor plating that's still in r418 um, so that the decision was made to remove that that radio set um, and put more modern avionics in there to keep it keep it going. It's still got the armor plate. It's still got yeah. armor plate in there. It's still yeah. got the guns in there. It's still got most stuff in there. But the radio, they did have to make a decision out of a practicality point of view mm-hmm. um, um, to keep the airplane. Going. Which does beg the question of, you know, how did the guys cope in 1940? Was it like that? Mm. And I don't know the answer to that. Yeah, that is an, that is an intriguing question, and when yeah. we, I suppose we 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 could have fun speculating, but we've got other things to talk about. Yeah. <laughs> so let, let, let's get into into flying them. We're going to go outside and have a look at B five and five in a minute. Yeah. But that experience, this is one of those completely subjective ones. First flight in a hurricane. What's going through your mind other than don't break it, don't yeah, break well, it, don't break it? I don't break it is, is a fairly major one, there, especially in 418. Um, the journey to fly that aeroplane started probably almost a year, maybe a little bit more before that. And um, when someone says, oh, you can fly my aeroplane, you never, you never really believe it until you're charging down the runway in it. Um, and James was incredibly generous to me and um, gave me that opportunity. A statement I will always be very, very thankful for um, and grateful. Um, so um, I was lucky enough to do quite a, well, a, a decent amount of Harvard time before, and so that, that prepared me nicely. Um, but I'd also spent a lot of time working at Duxford at the Aircraft Restoration Company, doing some maintenance on it and looking at it and, and really learning the aeroplane and learning the system. So if I ever got myself into the position where anything was going wrong, I kind of was, I had the knowledge yeah. to fix it. Uh, and that's an approach that I always take to any aeroplane is that you really, really want to be comfortable with the systems that are operating, especially these complex aeroplanes. Um, I'd started a couple of times and I taxied around Duxford on a quiet day, <laughs> just getting used to the noises rather than sitting in the cockpit making brum brum noises. Um, because it, all of that is quite a big thing. Yep. You know, I remember the first time I started that Merlin and it fired up. And I remember the first time I over-primed it and there's flames coming out. And I'm sat in a hurricane that's on fire. And, uh, you know, everything in your, um, in your bones wants to sort of stop turning the propeller and jump out. And actually the right thing to do is just to sit there and keep it cranking, keep it cranking until it you know, fires and then all the flames subside. Um, so it was good to have done all of that right before I'd even... St- Open, sat at the end of the runway and opened her up so um, that prepared me very very well for that um, the two seater was very early in its existence so there was no kind of exposure or go and have a go in the two seat hurricane to kind of get exposed to the noise um, but um, the first time I took off from the grass it was on a, I think it was on an easterly runway out of Duxford um, on the grass and um all I remember is just the amazing amount of noise. I don't think anything can prepare you for the noise uh, and, and vibration. And it was unlike anything. And, and I just wasn't really, as much as I prepared myself for that, that day and that moment, I was sat there going, is this right or have I done something wrong? <laughs> and I think you spend a, an awful lot of time when you fly a new type, especially these sort of aeroplanes, is that, you go, is, have, what have I done wrong? What, is, is that vibration normal? And it, even now, I sit when I fly. I go, oh, is, that, is that is that right? Um, but I remember getting the gear up and going away and then flying around and just going, oh, I can't believe it. I'm flying a Battle of Britain Hurricane, up of a you know Cambridgeshire. Um, Battle of Britain Scott. Hurricane off the grass oh, at Duxford. Duxford. Yeah. yeah. And then there's this moment where you go, oh, I've now got to get it back on the ground. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you kind of have to go and say, you know. Okay, we we we'll go back and we we we'll go and land it. Which clearly you've done because it's still with us. It is so. still with us. Thankfully, the, the, and that's, that's that's one of the things when you, whenever I'm lucky enough to fly her. So I, I flew her yesterday actually, and um, it was a good crosswind at Duxford, and um, it made me work quite hard. And uh, oh, of course, because we had the, the storm blowing yeah, through yesterday. Right. Yeah, yeah, and um, I thought I don't want to be the chapter in this book where it met Mike Collett 
<laughs> and and then it ground looped and then sat in a workshop for another number of years while someone else rebuilt it. They, they, they would have made you ring James as well, wouldn't you? Uh, <laughs> that's a phone call I wouldn't want to do. <laughs> but uh, yes. So, so but, yeah. yeah, sorry, I interrupted you. No, I mean, it's just a bit of British history, isn't it? Mm. Airplane. And you really feel that weight on your shoulders. Yeah. Whenever you fly it, you feel this. Oh, oh, you fly a hurricane. It must be amazing. It must be so much great fun. Um, it, it is. But there's but, a, an equal level of stress. But to go there is a quite a big responsibility flying them. It's um, for sure. Mm. So let's just, we're sat here in the Hurricane Heritage office. Mm. Where did that idea come from? Uh, which bit? The two-seater or, or...? Well, just generally, really. Because, yeah, the, the, the start of the outfit, because I'm, I'm assuming Ultimate Aerobatics was first, and then this came along with the, the two-seater in tow. Yeah, so um, the way it kind of played out was um, Hurricane Heritage was a brand that James had um, built up when he bought our 418 from Peter Vasher. And... He was going for his journey to go and fly the aeroplane. And so I was lucky enough to meet him once he'd basically completed that, that journey and he was flying his Hurricane. But he hadn't done any aerobatics. Um, and then in chance, there was a conversation where was, we need someone to teach James how to do, get his aerobatic rating and we need to teach, teach James how to fly the Harvard um, and do aerobatics in the Harvard. He knew how to fly Harvard but hadn't really done any aerobatics. And they, they asked me to do that. Um, and so that kind of set us on a path together where I was teaching James in his Harvard to do aerobatics. And, but before I was prepared to teach someone how to do aerobatics in, in that particular aeroplane, I needed to at least have done it a little bit on my own. <laughs> it, it didn't seem like an unreasonable request. So I, I got to go and fly Harvard. And, and from that, we, we formed a really good friendship. Um, and then the R418 journey continued with me on the coattails a little bit. Um, and then we moved into the two-seater. Um, that came along a little bit later. I'm going to actually ask you now. I'm going to put Abigail on the spot. Hello. So you'll need to unclip and hand her. No, nope. unclip. There we go. Because my question for you is, what is someone's experience like when they book a flight in the two-seater hurricane? So what? what let's, let's do a bit of a plug, really. Okay. Because this is also... You're selling this to my wife. (laughs) (laughs) I can do that. (laughs) So people normally find us either seeing us fly over, word of mouth, air shows, displays, so have become aware of us, or even just doing an internet search. We're the only two-seat hurricane in the world, so um, we tend to come up quite high on... um, search options um the website is great um so the yeah really proud of our website it's a you know great platform we've got some great photos and videos on there so there's a lot of information on there um but first port of call normally is people contact me um ask me about it so i tell them a bit about our operation when we operate get them to kind of potentially choose a date or you know check availability yeah, we get people booked in once once they've paid. So the options are half an hour, 40 minutes or 65 minutes. Um, but actually, we also arrange bespoke experiences for people. You know, if they have a budget they want to work towards. Um, so, for example, we had a chap who I think his grandfather had passed away and left him um, £5,000. Mm. And he wanted to spend that amount of money. So we did, uh, we arranged a bespoke experience for him. Uh, which was really lovely. So we can match budgets to um, experiences. And so um, anyway, so once someone has booked, they get sent a very nice gift box, um, which is, I can show you one shortly. <laughs> we, 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 <laughs> yeah, that'd be great. We'll put some um, pictures yeah. and things up. And... Um, so they get that in the mail um, with confirmation and just further information about their day. Um, and yeah, once they arrive here, they spend about the first hour with me. So we have to take them through safety standards and consent brief. So quite a formal brief. So there's some reading, uh, some PowerPoint information. Get them kitted up. So it's, then... it's, it's just like a longer version of going on a normal flight. It's a, a longer version and much more in depth than any other type of <laughs> flight. So it's quite comprehensive, uh, the brief. Right. Um, so not only done via PowerPoint, that's kind of a familiarization um, exercise but also in the aircraft itself everything is repeated you get to have a, the door the canopy mm. make sure that you're completely happy with what what you need to do in the event of an emergency do so, do you ever have people realize just how tight it is and start it's changing not tight actually um because you see i i am a little bit claustrophobic 
I don't think always, you'd find I, it. I, I always think, feel in yeah. those sort of com confined spaces. If you've bit... sat in a Spitfire, I would say, yes, they can be a little bit claustrophobic. But That's if you sit in, um, in, actually, <coughs> she's... It's it's very comfortable. Mm. There's there's a lot of room. Actually, it's not. I I don't feel like it has a feeling of claustrophobic. No, get no. It too exciting. Mm. No, it just doesn't have that mm. feeling of um, such mm. an enclosed cockpit. Um, I, I mean, certainly mm. if you've sat in anything similar, it, it's um, she's quite different. She's she was converted specifically for passenger carriage. You know, it was never done as a training aircraft, so um, it does have definitely does have a different feel in the back. So. Um, well, I guess that's that's the important point that it is designed to be a passenger aircraft, so it exactly, has that advantage yeah. over the Spits, which are quite yeah, they can be a little bit the... tight, yeah, tight fit. But no, she's um, she's very comfortable in the back, yeah, really comfortable. So yeah. Have you been up in her? I have been up in her. Yeah, <laughs> I've been lucky enough to go up in her. She flies beautifully. <coughs> really, very elegant warbird. Really, kind mm -hmm. of yeah, lovely aerobatics. Really stable. Beautiful to fly, very intuitive. Yeah, lovely, mm. lovely, lovely aircraft. So, you've got a pretty envious day job, really. Getting to it's not too bad. Let, <laughs> let, let people <laughs> bomb around and hurry. Yeah, we and, we have a, a lovely job in that we get to share an amazing aircraft um, with some amazing people. You know, often these are special occasions mm. for people. Uh, we've had villages club together to buy so, a villager. An experience, wow. um, yeah. So we've had some really lovely people come through our mm. doors, and um, it's it's such a lovely thing to be able to share the the hurricane with them, and yeah, really kind of make people's dreams come true without making it sound too much of a cliche. <laughs> I guess the one thing everyone has to keep in mind though is the British weather. So flexibility is key. Yeah. So for example, today um, we had three flights booked in. So we've flown two this morning. Um, obviously, you can see. It's a little bit cloudy, so yeah, I I phoned up three o'clock today and just offered him tomorrow, which is the the forecast tomorrow is a little bit um, a lot brighter actually. So I gave him the opportunity. So uh, we try and work with the weather. Often people have come from around the world to fly mm. with us as well. So we definitely try to make things work as much as we can. You know, we're a small team; we can be flexible. So we we make it work around the weather as much as possible. Um, we try not to, to cancel, but just shuffle, I would say, to make it work. And obviously, if, it, if the weather's terrible, we would have to reschedule. Yeah. But um, yeah, generally, we really try and make it work and work on the day to the best possible effect. So, Fantastic. So, my dear wife, Wendy, if you are listening, you see, it is a lovely day out. <laughs> of course, she could go up in it. That would actually she be could, a fantastic okay, idea. So she could go up in the hurricane mm -hmm. and she could go up alongside you in a Harvard if you wanted to go in the hurricane. Yeah. There see, are lots of different options. We could put the 108 alongside you both with smoke on, have a dog fight. Oh, you see, there's, see, there's lots of lovely things. This, could this, do. Is, this is fantastic because she, she endures my passions for this oh. quite, quite a bit. So okay. in, in the back of my mind, it's not so much me because I'm sure an opportunity would come up again, but yeah. then, yeah, that so, would be... So, yeah, a, Hurricane Harvard ME 108, that would be a nice day out for you both. Perfect, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 can, I, can, I can see her face right now. It's not as keen as many of our <laughs> listeners will probably be, because she has to put up with She'll this sort of stuff. Yeah. You, Between, can, yeah. you can go up in, yeah, you can go and have a, a lovely formation flight, wave at each other, take photos, it'd be brilliant. Yeah, and then she can hold going up in the Hurricane over me forever, <laughs> by yeah. saying we, we can't do it again that is fantastic thank you so much my pleasure and i think let's head out and have a look at her yeah sure we're going to take a quick break so that we can get the latest from the pima air and space museum with head of collections andrew bowley <laughs> Here we are at the Pima Air and Space Museum with some of our Korean War vintage aircraft. Um, here is our F-86E Sabre, um, which was the preeminent American jet fighter during the Korean conflict. Um, originally, we were flying a lot of straight wing aircraft like the F-84 and, you know, reciprocating engine aircraft still like the Mustang, various other aircraft. Um, when this aircraft made its debut, the MiG-15, which was used by the North Koreans, um, with also probably some help from other nations. Um, but it was a game changer, swept wings, had cannon, and really, you know, overpowered anything with a straight wing. Um, 
around that time, our F-86 started coming into Korea, which the two aircraft were pretty equally matched. Uh, armament aside, you know, the uh, F-86 had 50 calibers, while the MiG had, I believe, 20 millimeter cannons, if I recall correctly, three. Um, so 30 millimeter, I think it was. 30, was it 30 millimeter? Two, two, two 30, 220, something, something like that, yeah. Okay. Cannon. Not the armaments. It, they're cannons, the machine guns, guns yeah. which has always been a big argument. You know, the Americans were always full in on the 50 cal and the machine gun side of things. Well, a lot of other nations tended to lean towards cannons. You know, so depends who you ask, which is the better air, aerial weapon. But our F-86 is actually a real combat veteran. We would the 51st fighter interceptor wing. Um, it's a bit of a Franken airplane. The fuselage did come from the a Korean War veteran. The wings did come from another aircraft, but that was one of those things where we decided to go with obviously the identity of the fuselage, which you know has the more interesting history and has an actual Korean War combat provenance. Um, it could be a little bit of a time too to talk about our curatorial choices with paint schemes. Yes. Usually we always try to paint our aircraft in markings that are historically accurate for that aircraft. This F-86 is an example of this. The markings on the aircraft are based on photographic evidence from the Korean War of this aircraft. Our MiG-15, on the other hand, like most surviving MiGs in a lot of collections, is a Polish MiG. It's not a Korean MiG. But because for this, we decided we wanted to tell the story of the Korean War, so we did paint this aircraft in North Korean markings, where usually we don't do that. Um, we usually always try to paint the aircraft for, uh, you know, the historically accurate markings for that aircraft. But like I said, once in a while when we have another story to tell, we'll uh, make an assumption. Also, if we painted all our MiGs, they would all be pretty much in Polish markings instead of uh, representing some of the different um, Warsaw Pact nations like we have. To learn more about what is on display and what events are coming up at the Pima Air and Space Museum in Tucson, Arizona, please do check out their website at www.pimaair.org. And now, back to the show. Right, so we have come out to see this beautiful aircraft. Um, Shall we do a bit of a walk around, Mike? Yeah, absolutely. So um, this is B505, otherwise known as PEGS. Our, um, well, she's really a Mark 12 Hurricane, but she's dressed up as a Mark 2B, so we normally describe her as a Mark 2B. Um, but we just should point out that she is a glorious Canadian car and foundry one. Yeah, as you can see from the serial numbers at the top. There we go. So I'm, I'm with a, a country woman, shall we say. That's one way of describing it. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, so, um, walk around the back. So we've got the rudder obviously here um, with the rudder servo there onto the elevator and the elevator trim. Looking around here and then coming back. All of this being Irish linen covered, which made it so robust during the war. And they could easily patch it up. Um, and then coming around the exhaust stain fuselage as the the team haven't given it a wash yet. Um, how she'd been flying today. But to be fair, it adds, it, adds, it, adds, it adds a bit adds of a tina, it. doesn't it? It looks fantastic. Yeah, it looks it? a little bit. And I have a few sort of scuff marks where certain people have been sat in the front seat of the, uh, the aeroplane. Well, well yeah, let, let, let's be fair. I was a bit excited. Let's, yeah, that's right. Yeah. And, 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 so you should be. <laughs> so you should be. Um, so we've got the gun bays here. These are obviously very important. To make sure that they are locked. Um, because they can cause real problems if someone leaves them open when we take off, mm. um, because they will open against the airflow, which can cause some issues. However, there is really no need for us to be going in and out of the gun ports in, in this day and age. There's no ammunition in there, so we're not topping it up anymore. Um, ailerons, standard stuff. And then wandering around to our- The business end. The business end of the airplane, where you've got our lovely nose art for pegs which I'm sure we'll talk about shortly. Um, now, the way you can tell a later Hurricane is, is the oil tank is here um, and you've got the refuel set, um, cap on this on the wing, whereas the early Mark 1s are in the ring route here. Mm -hmm. It's always quite a giveaway. And also the radiators, if you can see the radiators. This, having the bigger engine needed a bigger radiator to keep it nice and cool. Yeah. 
Um, lots of bugs in the oil. Lots of bugs in the oil. It's a bit of a buggy day today. Um, yeah, as I yeah, say, yeah. she has been busy flying today. So it's not just my house that's full of daddy long legs. No, no, the hangar's full of them. <laughs> hangar's full of them. Um, uses facts for you. Obviously massive undercarriage doors, which are designed not only to seal the gear up when the gear comes up, but also to help drag the gear down and lock it if there's a hydraulic failure. Um, now, you might wonder why these, um, these are all painted yellow. And that's because that's the lock. And the lock is up into the wheel well of the aeroplane, but I can see that in the cockpit. And by the fact that it's yellow, it makes it really obvious when that's up and locking in there. So if the lights don't work on the undercarriage um, indicators, um, I can actually just look and I can see that the undercarriage is nicely locked. Yeah, because that was something that's crawl over here. Something I never knew. Despite all, is there's the little window? Yeah, so you can see the wheels side. through through the floor there with the window, and this is where the locks go into here. So it's a lot of thought going into it for the pilot yeah. to ensure that it's there, especially when you're saying when you have a hydraulic problem, the door, the doors are designed to pull the, pull the gear out as well. That's right. And it also gives the Hurricane a very low um, undercarriage and flap limiting speed of 120 miles an hour. Um, if you think of the amount of load on a hydraulic pump of pulling this, this wheel and this door up, mm -hmm. you know, there's a hell of a lot of force there, which is why it's got such a low limit. Um, we've got a uh, Hamilton standard propeller on it, rather than as it would have done in Canada. Which, let's be fair, the Hamilton propeller is a Hamilton standard propeller under license, really, isn't it? Oh, oh there we go. Oh, so this well, is, this well, is well, what you can always say to. All I would say is that these are a much easier propeller to maintain <laughs> and much cheaper. It's, yeah, to maintain them as a Havilland propeller. Certainly on our Mark I Hurricane, which has got the Havilland on it. Um, yeah, and that's obviously wood, whereas this is metal. Mm. Yeah. Um, big radiator, so the centre is the oil, the outer is the coolant. Um, we've got the six guns on it. Not that the guns are in it anymore, unfortunately. Um, but as it was a hurry bomber, as Peter Teichman um, did the restoration as a hurry bomber, the option would be to take one of the machine guns out, that one, um, and then you could put the bomb racks mm -hmm. underneath on these pickups here. We have got the bomb racks, um, but we choose not to fly with them on because it adds drag and weight, and we're trying to keep the aircraft as light as possible to give us a greater ability to carry passengers. And you then get into all the fun and games about people arguing about, oh, you've got the carrier, why don't you put a bomb on it? And they don't understand the fun well, that the right. CAA put through. Yeah, it. so we were I mean, it's sort of in early talks of maybe it'd be fun to put some bombs on it. Um, so maybe this it might be a winter project to have a chat about that. <laughs> but they, the CAA oddly get quite funny about um, people flying with bomb racks and bombs underneath here. Now, clearly, we're not going to put a proper bomb on it. It will be a, a wooden mock-up of one. But yeah. um, it'd be nice to be able to show it off as a hurry bomber because there's so few of them mm. around. Um, and it shows the, the, um, the capability of the aeroplane. Yes, which kept it in service, especially in the Far East, right to the end. Well, that's right. That you know, the Hurricane served in every single theatre of the war. Um, and when you think they were firing them off um, ships in the, in the North Atlantic, I mean, it's just incredible, isn't it? Um, and the poor pilots knowing they're going to have to ditch next to a ship and hope they could. Well, I mean, it's just terrifying. Yeah. Just absolutely terrifying. That's, um, but yeah. luckily they knew they got extra rum when they got back on board for that. <laughs> I'm not sure it makes it worth it. <laughs> I certainly wouldn't, yeah, I don't think that would bribe me it's, to do it. It's a one-way trip. You've got to go up and shoot down an FW200 Condor <laughs> and yeah, then park yourself in freezing cold bloody water and hope somebody stops to That's pick right. you up. That's right, yeah. Right. Yeah, there's a big debate about whether you uh, ditch or bail out. Mm. I think the just consensus is to bail out. Um, but anyway, um, what else can I talk to you about on it? Um, she does get very hot. I don't know how the guys flew them out in the desert when there's a tank mm. buster variant. You know, we were recently uh, a couple of weeks back at Paris, the Villa Roche Air Legend air mm -hmm. show, and the temperature was about 35, 37 degrees, and that was really, the aeroplanes didn't like it, and I certainly didn't like it. Because um, you're sitting on top of the radiator. Yeah, aren't you? that's right. Um, and I, I, the design is just slightly different to the, the Spitfire, so when it gets hot, it doesn't cool down quite as quickly as what the Spitfire, Spitfire does. Um, so I don't know quite how they dealt with it in the desert. They had slightly modified hurricanes, obviously for the air intake, um, but I'm not entirely sure about how they kept the coolant cool. 
Mm. Really? But they must play clearly manage it. So. <laughs> well, should we have a look at the inside of it yeah, and see where some of the Yes, we some, found some our way up the, the, the steps. Fully caster and tower wheel. The tower wheel came off of eBay. The lovely story with that one um, <laughs> is that that was on a wheelbarrow made by a prisoner of war at RF Coltishaw. Um, and so when I found it on eBay and bought it, you know, and I, this is how you find parts. And obviously, our maintenance company, the aircraft restoration company, have to go, uh, we're happy with that tyre. Mm. Um, but um, when I told the story to the people that I bought it off, they couldn't believe that their wheelbarrow. Uh, tyre was uh, back on a flying hurricane. <laughs> That's fantastic. Yeah. That's a... So I guess we have a look in the back seat to start with. So the canopy is split very, very nicely. Hawk Restorations have done an amazing job of this back seat modification. So um, if you can appreciate, it's a working aeroplane. So um, she's had a busy summer. But it's you know we try and look after her and it's um, all pretty immaculate in there. Lots and lots of room. People are always surprised by how much room there is in it, and also the visibility. Mm -hmm. the, the visibility out the back is almost I'd say as good as the back seat of the Harvard. A little bit limited for instruments. You've got an airspeed indicator, but the reality is you don't really need very much more. But you're hoping the guy in the front's doing most. Well, of that's right. I mean that's that's the business end for for me. So if I close that back up. That is just so nicely done. It's yeah, and it, and it makes access in the back cockpit really easy. Um, so I flew 102 year old um, this year and I've flown some guys that have gone to the bottom of those steps in a mobility scooter and they still managed to get themselves in and out of the <laughs> aeroplane. It's amazing what happens when the adrenaline starts to pump and they get close to the aeroplane they've dreamt of flying. Um, so if we slide the canopy back. And they collect, and there's the business end of the aeroplane. Um, you have to forgive the quad lock mount on the side there, but <laughs> the rest of it's fairly original. It's, um, in this day and age, having moving map GPSs for these flights are um, is, is, is very important. But, um, but as for the rest of it, it's pretty accurate. Yeah. yeah. So you're not going to aside of the. Uh, Little GPS-y sort of things. The rest of it is going to be in there. So you've got your That's right. Yeah, so you've got modern avionics at the top, unfortunately. But again, it's this is a working aeroplane, so it's really important that we have it um, accessible. Um, but the rest of it's all, it's all there. Silly question times. Yep. Reason for the stopwatch? Uh, well, it just means I can manage the flight times. It's, got, it's quite useful. We, as Abigail spoke earlier, we have 30-minute flight, 40-minute flight, 65-minute flights. Mm -hmm. um, so if I've sat that running, then I know how far the flight will. Um, because okay, here you go. Do you get carried away when you've got something? Always, yeah, always, yeah, always. <laughs> yeah, I'd never got you know, <laughs> I'd go off for hours by the choice, but um, but it's uh, yeah, I, I, I was saying to you before, I just remember being at Duxford when it was up there for the, the Christmas show with all the other ones. Yeah. It's, it's so tastefully done. If you didn't know what you were looking for, you wouldn't notice the extra bit of glazing and That's the extra. Right. Yeah, well, um, she spent quite a lot of the time this year leading formations of hurricanes around. And a lot of the people don't realise that it's actually got two seats mm -hmm. in it. Um, obviously, in an air show, we can't have a second person in it. Yeah. Um, so when we land, people, oh, can I have a look in the front seat? We go, oh, yeah. And they, they're always surprised to find that there's, a, there's another seat in the back of the aeroplane. So a passenger gets in on the right side. Yep. A pilot gets in on the left. Left side, yep. Yep. And yep. away you go. That's right. Yeah. Wonderful. Okay, so we're inside, and yes, ladies and gentlemen, I do fit, so, which is a good thing. So, what's our sort of procedure here for turning her on? Well, first thing Not first, that we're going to do that, Well, course, you don't want it to start and then charge across the airfield uncontrollably, so it's no. always handy to set the parking brake. Um, so, the parking <laughs> brake is a, a fairly British system on, on that lever there, mm -hmm. and then now between your legs you can see a brake pressure gauge. So you can see that the main pressure, the top needle, is at about 280, 290 PSI. So that means we've got plenty of air in the system. Mm -hmm. So we then pull the lever, which I'll do as much as I can from here, but you can see the needles are coming up there yep. and saying that it's applying pressure to the brakes. And we set that as a parking brake. 
Um, we would then turn the fuel onto the reserve tank, um, which is down there. And then we've got a fuel pump, uh, which is just here on the left. And we'd run that for, depending on how hot she is, would depend how much fuel we'd put in it. Okay. So she's already hot today, so I'd probably only give her maybe five seconds worth of uh, fuel. Okay. All right. And then on your right hand side, you've got the K gas primer. So I'd unscrew that and then we'd pump that and give it maybe two shots given the temperature that she's currently in and then I'd lock it. And then coming all the way over to the left and you can see there's the throttle but there's also a mixture lever there. So I then put the mixture into fully rich. So all the way forward. All the way forward and make sure, because there is two dents, there's, there's lean, how do they describe it? Um, lean and rich, so we'd go fully rich. And then in the bottom left hand corner we've got a boost and a starter core. It's over there. Yeah. So in the spit, that's on the other side. Uh, yes, it is. Yeah. Yeah. In the spit, it's, it's over here somewhere. Yeah. So you'd end up with your arm kind of going across a little bit just to kind of get that to work. So I traditionally push the booster, and I can hear that the booster's working in the headset because it's causing a bit of electrical interference, mm -hmm. and then hitting the starter. Now that should start the engine. <laughs> so once it goes, then you turn the two mags on. Okay. Which is next to it. Yep. Mm -hmm. Just there, flip them up. And then your attention is very rapidly drawn over to the engine instruments over there. And the first thing you're looking for is the oil pressure to come alive and start to rise. And what happens if that doesn't happen? You shut everything shut down it really down. quickly. Shut it down really yeah. quickly. Yeah. On a cold day, you know, you expect it to take a few seconds to come up, but generally she'll come up quite quickly. So that's that one, and then... And then the one below. Oil, oil the PSI. Oil Yep. So oil pressure there, oil temperature. That's right. And then coolant. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then what? we monitor and warm her up yep. if necessary. So if it's cold, how long? Well, we're really looking for about twenty degrees on on the oil temperature. So not not much. So not much. No, on a day like today, I think put, I think the outside temperature is about twenty. So she's nearly there anyway. Mm -hmm. um, and about twenty, we can start to taxi it. But before we want to go, we're looking for temperatures of the coolant to be about sixty and the ore temperature to be about 40. They're the numbers that we're looking for. Really. And then? Um, and, then we're, and then we're taxiing over to the runway, do our power checks, and then take her into the air. So if we spin round yep. to show, dear listener, that that is the back seat from in here. Yep. Again, you're right, that is a lot of room and a lot of, a lot of glazing to be able to check things out. And I guess people getting videos with GoPros and things. Yeah, and absolutely, and that's what these mounts are here that you can see. We can either run a 360 or we can do a GoPro. Most people love a, a, a hero cam, <laughs> um, and it's wired into the intercom just to kind of share the experience. Um. See, for me, and I am biased, that's a very pretty wing. It is a very pretty wing. Yeah. I mean, it's a, you're sat looking at an RF roundel with machine guns sticking out of it. I mean, it, it doesn't get much cooler than that. <laughs> It is very, very cool. And the view over the nose is, is lovely. It's, um, yeah, I, I'm, inside of me, I'm making very squee sort of noises. So thank you very much for no letting me I mean, me if I close the canopy, it's always probably worth a look. Just, oh just, yeah. Watch your head, just duck a little bit. And then you see all the, the way they've done the canopy on the Hurricane. These, these planes actually can get in the way a little bit for formation flying. Would you not be using them to also formate? That you'd be lining them mm, up or are you just still Yeah, maybe at... to a degree, but quite often you can lose an aeroplane in, in these, these centre sections here. So, so it's just something to look at. And it's very unique to the Hurricane, really. Which I guess in a fighter is not exactly what you want. Not really, no. Mm. But again, the aeroplanes before that were open cockpit. Yeah, so, so that does make life a little bit better. Yeah. yeah. Um, and you were saying with no gun sight here, it is coming out. I'm yeah, guns, it yeah, gun sight would come out a little, protrude into the cockpit a little bit. So, um. Fantastic. Um, you're not going to be able to get me out of it now. No, I'm it's all right. You can spend a more time in there. It's not a problem. <laughs> She's not flying again today. Yeah, sorry. You might have to be pulled into the hangar, but... Um, <laughs> but it's, it's terribly familiar and just a little bit different as well, which yeah. is, I suppose, a mark of a lot of the, the RAF aircraft That's at the right. time. So. Yeah, I mean, you, you're generally always looking at a standard six, which is that sensor, yeah. and the RAF always put the... Well, 
um, the engine instruments together on the right hand side, like so. So it's yeah. I mean, the big got you, and I'm not is, is the gear and the flap mechanism down the right hand side. Yeah, sorry, that's what I didn't um, which, ask, which is probably worth looking at. So see if I change hands. Um, and get so that makes it very unique. Um, yeah, with, with yeah. the for the hurricane. So try that. There we go. There that's she is. It. So there. it's like a gearbox on a car. Um, so, so does it return to the centre each time? You well, yeah, so in practice that's what you're meant to do. So on what I call the fuselage side, so the side of the wall, that's Over the here. flaps. Yep. And on the inside is the gear. Um, so that will activate the hydraulic systems um, and you don't want to leave that pressurised. So you go back into neutral every time you've, you've sorted it out. But um, So is it sort of, is it like a push and twist sort of thing? Yeah, so basically there's a little lever on the side down the um, midway down. You can push that in and then slightly. So if you do that, go and you can try it. This one? That's it, and go towards the fuselage side. And then you can go forward. There you go. So that would be selecting the flaps up. Okay. And then once the flaps are up, and the flap indicator is actually in this dark hole down here, which you might be able to see. Oh, there you go. Here, yep. um, obviously, you know, that's where you, exactly where you want to be looking when you're coming <laughs> to land. Um, and then you can go back into neutral once it's there. So you just slip it in into the middle. That's it. That's, that seems like something that was very good on a drawing board. Yeah, so someone who didn't fly aeroplanes obviously designed yeah. that. And the, the, the needle underneath it is the hydraulic pressure. Um, and a little adjuster on the right hand side would be for the canopy de-icing system. Oh right, okay. Yeah, so that would pump fluid yeah. along these holes here and blow it onto the windscreen. So that'd just be alcohol, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I don't know, I don't know quite what they used. Oddly enough, we don't fly in icing conditions anymore, so... Fun, funny that, yeah. Um, but I've yeah. yet to have a canopy that <laughs> freezes <Just> up. <laughs> it's, yeah, so it's... Yeah. And it's all important. Yes. Let's see if we can... There we go. Yeah. There it is. Can I twist it? There we go. In my head, dear listener, I'm going back and back and back and yeah, back. Yeah, I know. Well, it's, when we do our uh, dog fights with the 108, or if we're flying out of ducks with, with the bouchon, uh, you, you definitely did a dagger dagger <laughs> noise. I assure you. Yeah. Okay, let's let's be honest. When you go into the dog fights. How serious is it taken with the person in the bush or do they have to give oh, themselves no. Well, at the end of the day, you're always trying to look after the passenger. Um, so depends how who we're flying with, but we try and get a bit of a beat of how much G, how much roller coaster sort of um, experience they got in the back. Mm -hmm. um, and if they're really game, then we can kind of up it and then it, then it goes into two pilots having an awful lot of fun. And hopefully the passenger, well, always the passenger having an amazing time. Yes. But it... Dog fighting is a very good way of making someone feel rough. <laughs> so it's really, really important to us to have some communication with the passenger. A, a, a safe word. Yeah, basically a safe <laughs> word. I mean, I flew with a 80 year old a couple of weeks ago and we had the most amazing dog fight um, with Martin Oval Mo flying the Bouchon. And um, yeah, and I, I thought 80 year olds and he loved every minute of it. Absolutely loved it. And we were chow, looping, chow chasing, barrel rolls. It was, <laughs> it was fabulous. And he loved every moment of it. Wonderful. Yeah. I taxied back with him going, I love you, I love you, I love you. It was a quite, <laughs> quite an experience, actually. Ah. Yeah. Well, there we go. I'm just sitting here fiddling because you don't often get to fiddle with stuff like that. No, it's very cool. Yeah. Super. Mike, thank you so much. Absolute pleasure. Now, persuade your wife to come and have a go. <laughs> I'll let you come and have a go. It's been a few days and I'm still absolutely buzzing from that experience. I cannot thank Mike and Abigail enough for them putting up with me and my cough. I seriously hope I didn't get them ill. As you can see, I'm still getting over it. That would be terrible. But I can't thank them enough for their time and letting me literally crawl all over pegs, which was just the most amazing thing. I was covered in oil. It was, oh goodness, it was fantastic. If you want to take a flight in PEGS yourself or one of the experiences that we talked about, the best place to go is to hurricaneheritage.com. On the website, you're going to be able to find out all you're going to need to know about the different things that they can do for you, how much it's all going to cost, and when you're going to be able to do it. Bookings are there. Again, remember, be a little bit flexible if you can. The weather today isn't too bad, but it was just a little bit claggy when we were there on Thursday, hence pushing that one flight back a bit. Do check them out. All the links will be in the description below, along with their socials. 
And as always, got to thank our incredible sponsors out at the Pima Air and Space Museum in Tucson, Arizona, for their continued support of the podcast. We're going to have some more fun stuff coming up with them. So in this episode, as you heard, we had Andrew chatting about the MiG-15 and the Sabre. We're going to change these things up going in the future. I've heard they've done some filming for me. We shall see what that filming entails. So if you want to support the pod, tell your friends you've all been great. Stats are up, numbers are going up, which is what you want in these sorts of things. Remember, put some stars into your podcast app of choice, hit the like and subscribe buttons, do all that good thing. It really does help. And I've been humbled by the messages that you've been sending. Thank you so much. Of course, if you want to become a damn castier, you can for three pounds a month plus fat at the bottom tier. You get all of this stuff early with different intros and outros, and it goes to keep him going for paying for the petrol to drive around the M25 and deal with cyclists on the M4. Yeah, that happened. Until next time, thank you so much. Our next episode is going to be about R101 with a fantastic SC Gwyn. We do segue a little bit to talk about Quana Parker, but it'll all become clear. So thank you very much. Until next time, do take care of yourselves. The Damcasters is hosted and produced by Matt Bow and is a Bony Abroad podcast production. To learn more about our podcast and check out our previous episodes, head to www.thedamcasterspod.com.